Welcome back to our third session of the foundation series. I want to uh, offer a big kudos to Jason for his earlier presentation, which I think did a brilliant job at teasing out the many different considerations when it comes to thinking hard about the evidence. Uh, when it comes to medical cannabis, often the answers are not black and white. There are some rare exceptions, but mostly it's shades of gray. And those shades of gray are complex and often require uh, hard thinking about patient preferences. And I think you did a great job highlighting how important that is. What I'm gonna be talking about this afternoon is the other side of the coin, the risks and harms of cannabis. Uh, I'm going to show my disclosures again. They're the same as before. None of them involve uh, commercial cannabis entities in any way. Uh, I'm going to assume most people saw them in the earlier session. I won't go through each one in turn. Um, and I'm just going to show you the laundry list because um, there's a lot to cover when it comes to risks and harms of cannabis. Um, we're going to talk first about cannabis use disorder. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and then we're going to move to cannabis and cognition and the related area of how cannabis relates to uh, car crashes. Um, cannabis use disorder is, of course, a psychiatric condition. Uh, the technical definition of uh, addiction to cannabis, but we're also going to talk about how cannabis relates to other psychiatric conditions in terms of associations and some longitudinal data. We're then going to kind of leave the brain and focus on two other domains for cannabis harms. The first being the lungs in terms of cannabis and lung health, and the second being uh, the GI system uh, in terms of cannabis hyperemesis or cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. And then I'm gonna offer some, some broad conclusions about what we know about uh, risks and harms overall. Full disclosure, I am a clinical psychologist and part of my research program does include investigating cannabis and cognition and cannabis use disorder. So I will have more heavily emphasize those domains than some of the other domains. Um, but hopefully the, uh, the data coming out of my lab will um, be of interest. Yeah, and just to reiterate, we're always thinking here about the balance and thinking hard about on target benefits of possible med medical applications of cannabis and then the potential harms some of the work I'll talk about pertains to medical cannabis. Most of it pertains to what we know more generally about cannabis use and its associated risks and harms, but always thinking about how do we balance the two relative to each other in terms of thinking critically about the risk benefit ratio of cannabis. All right, so let's get started with cannabis use disorder. So um, in terms of thinking about substance use disorders, I wanna emphasize that uh, there are various categories that we typically use. And for those of you who are not familiar with psychiatric nosology, hopefully this schematic will be helpful. It's a figure from a review I was a co-author of relatively recently. And really when we think of uh, substance use, we can think of there being uh, various levels uh, typically nested within uh, one another. So at one level, there's the amount of substance use that's associated with some level of statistical risk of negative consequences that may be for alcohol or cannabis or other substances. Uh, and then after a person reaches a certain threshold, they can be diagnosed with a substance use disorder using the DSM-5 uh, formulation. And that is a psychiatric diagnosis. It ranges in severity from mild to severe. There's an intermediate category of moderate there are essentially 11 symptoms in the syndrome of substance use disorder, and two or three constitutes a mild substance use disorder. Uh, four to five co constitutes a moderate substance use disorder, and six or greater constitutes a severe substance use disorder. And although DSM-5 does not have a term for addiction, it's considered to a large extent stigmatizing and potentially uh, uh, at greater risk of misuse than substance use disorder. Um, generally, we think of a, a addiction as being at the uh, higher severity end of the spectrum of substance use disorder. Typically, 
severe or possibly moderate to severe substance use disorder. So what we're talking about now is cannabis use disorder, <clears throat> excuse me, specifically the substance use disorder, and that will encompass uh, addiction to cannabis as well as potentially lower severity manifestations. So what are we talking about in terms of these 11 symptoms? These are all of them uh, laid out together, but they, they really do um, overlap with one another to a certain extent and or at least cluster together. So uh, in terms of the first symptoms, there are four that reflect a um, compulsive relationship with the uh, psychoactive drug. So intrusive and uncomfortable or intense cravings for the drug, trying to regulate use but not being able to, using a lot of uh, time or energy in obtaining or using the drug and using it for in larger amounts or over a longer period of time than a person intends to. These are the four symptoms that kind of reflect the lack of um, capacity to, to self-regulate consumption. The second cluster of symptoms falls into the category of um, adverse consequences from substances. So continuing to use a substance despite knowing that it's physically or psychologically harmful, fa failure to fulfill major role obligations in vocational settings or educational settings or in the home, continuing to use despite uh, interpersonal or social problems, uh, giving up activities or reducing activities because of cannabis use or using cannabis in a situation where it's physically hazardous. This could be when driving, but it could also be if you are in a safety sensitive job. And all of these symptoms fundamentally reflect a person who's continuing to use cannabis in spite of adverse consequences. And then the final two symptoms are uh, tolerance and withdrawal, these reflect the development of physiological dependence, tolerance being the need for more cannabis to experience the de desired effect or a markedly diminished effect by, uh, of the, the drug um, with continued use of the same amount over time. And then withdrawal is the other side of the coin that when the individual stops using cannabis, they experience the characteristic withdrawal syndrome, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, or the individual uh, describes one of their reasons for continuing to use cannabis as a specific strategy to relieve or avoid withdrawal symptoms. And that may be conscious or unconscious, obviously conscious if described that way, but in some cases, individuals may simply use cannabis uh, chronically to, to offset or stave off uh, withdrawal symptoms without necessarily being fully aware of those withdrawal symptoms. So here again, that's the other uh, uh, domain within the, the CUD criteria. Only two symptoms are needed for a diagnosis of cannabis use disorder. Typically, we would consider moderate or higher or severe or higher, that is, uh, four or six or more symptoms is reflecting uh, addiction to cannabis. In terms of cannabis withdrawal, unfortunately for a long time, there was a myth that cannabis was not physiologically dependence inducing. Um, that is not the case. And there is a well-documented withdrawal syndrome. Uh, this includes aspects of negative affectivity. So feeling nervous or anxious, irritable, angry, restless, experiencing depressed mood, it also includes some um, appetite symptoms such as decreased appetite or weight loss. Uh, it includes difficulty with sleeping, uh, including insomnia or very vivid dreams. And then there are also physical symptoms that manifest, including uh, abdominal pain, shaking, uh, sweating or fevers, chills or headaches. So uh, a quite uncomfortable withdrawal syndrome not a dangerous withdrawal syndrome, such as uh, alcohol withdrawal, but one that certainly causes quite a lot of distress and can be longstanding depending on the, the level of use a person is engaging in. So how does cannabis use disorder come to be? Well, the kind of narrow uh, etiology is based very much on neuroadaptive changes within the endocannabinoid system. And we talked this morning about what the endocannabinoid system uh, comprises. It's fundamentally 
uh, two neurotransmitters, 2-AG and anandamide uh, that uh, bind with uh, CB1 and CB2 receptors, as well as other receptors, both in the central nervous system and in the peripheral uh, nervous system and uh, other organ systems. And fundamentally, neuroadaptation refers to the changes in the CB1 receptor density in all of these different areas by virtue of uh, chronic stimulation by cannabis leading to the upregulation of the CB1 receptor uh, in many different locations. And as a result of this, um, what we see is that, uh, or as a result of this, many of the symptoms of cannabis use disorder are believed to manifest, ranging from the self-regulatory deficits to the negative consequences to the physiological dependence. We can see this uh, in vivo using positron emission tomography. So this is a, a study specifically looking at um, CB1 receptor binding in individuals with cannabis use disorder versus controls. And what you can see is uh, at the bottom of this slide, you can see the uh, localization of CB1 receptors density. And then uh, you can see in the top portion of the slide where there are differences in different brain regions. And uh, you can see that in, in numerous locations, the anterior cingulate, the hippocampus, the insula, prefrontal cortex, parietal lobe, uh, temporal uh, lobe, there are significant differences in the density of uh, CV1 receptors. This is just a, a different way of visualizing the same data. It's really the uh, contrast of the two that again shows just the, the kind of magnitude of difference, sizable percentage differences in terms of CV1 receptors and again, anterior cingulate, amygdala, um, parahippocampal gyrus, uh, parietal lobe, posterior cingulate, prefrontal cortex, a, a large variety of brain regions that are responsible for diverse uh, cognitive activities and faculties. What's really interesting is uh, what happens over time, because obviously this is a cross-sectional study. We don't actually know whether or not the individuals uh, in this study might have looked different from uh, or the, the cannabis using individuals, the CUD positive individuals, whether they might have uh, looked different from the control participants to start with. But there's some evidence also that these really do reflect the neuroadaptations that are theorized. So if we look at a, a different investigation using a similar design, here you can see individuals with cannabis dependence, the ICD definition here, uh, versus healthy controls in green. And again, we can see that overall there is a higher, uh, th there are significant differences in uh, CB1 receptor density. And this is the case in a uh, wide variety of uh, brain regions, including critical ones for emotion, incentive salience, um, interoceptive processing, memory, executive function and decision making. Um, but what's really interesting about this study is that in addition to documenting the differences between individuals with CUD and controls, it looked at whether or not changes took place over time and uh, specifically over a 28 day abstinence period. So here you can see the uh, initial baseline scan and the uh, follow-up scans at two days and 28 days um, post-abstinence. Uh, and what we see is that there's a significant difference at baseline, but that gradually dissipates over time until it actually reaches statistical non-significance. So um, over time, uh, as we would imagine, of course, there's no difference in the uh, healthy controls, but individuals who are biochemically verified as uh, uh, reducing their cannabis use do no longer look different, although, um, or, or increasingly look less different. Although again, we do see significant kind of global differences, suggesting perhaps there are some innate differences in terms of people who develop cannabis use disorder. I would be remiss as a psychologist not to emphasize some of the behavioral determinants of uh, cannabis use disorder. And in this regard, there are a couple that are, are very well established at this point. One is a form of impulsivity called delayed discounting or devaluing future rewards at the expense of, uh, or 
devaluing future rewards uh, in favor of choosing smaller immediate rewards. This is a, 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 a prototypic delay discounting curve on the left-hand side here showing an individual devaluing uh, rewards over time. The other domain is high cannabis reinforcing value. This is a prototypic demand curve showing valuation of, of a commodity uh, over escalating levels of price. And what we've seen with cannabis use disorder is we see both the steeper delay discounting reflecting higher impulsivity, greater prioritization of smaller immediate rewards relative to larger delayed rewards. And we also see higher demand for cannabis as a reinforcer uh, across this demand curve that is uh, an indicative or an indicator of uh, reinforcing value of the drug. These have been shown in individual observational studies and recently have been uh, documented as being highly consistent across the literature in meta-analyses showing elevated delay discounting and elevated cannabis reinforcing value in individuals with either high levels of cannabis use or cannabis use disorder. The last behavioral determinant I'll emphasize is, as I alluded to in the morning talk, there are five different domains that people report uh, using cannabis uh, as, as motives for. And uh, there's a, an increasingly large literature trying to understand which motives are associated with developing cannabis use disorder. This is just an example from one of my trainees, Molly Scarf. She looked at uh, a, an adult community sample of cannabis users drawn from the Hamilton area. And what she found when she looked at these five different domains, social motives, enhancement motives, coping motives, conformity motives, and expansion motives, she found that two of the five were really critical in terms of the severity of cannabis use disorder. And really this focused on individuals who were heavily driven by the psychoactive effects in terms of positive reinforcement, enhancement motives, and also the um, uh, coping motives uh, seeking negative reinforcement or reflecting re negative reinforcement. And what she found also was that coping motives mediated the relationship between cannabis severity and uh, concurrent psychiatric and uh, somatic symptoms. And this is a, a, a similar finding to other findings that show over time, when it comes to motives, what matters less than all of the motives that people will report in general in healthy populations. Um, but it's really about the narrowing of uh, motives to either specifically the uh, positively reinforcing or the negatively reinforcing uh, basis for cannabis use. So how common is cannabis use disorder? I'm gonna go back to the slide I showed in the earlier talk uh, looking at overall rates uh, of just a bit over 14%. In Canada, the lifetime prevalence of cannabis use disorder is estimated to be around 7%. Not a small number, but certainly a minority of individuals who will ever use cannabis across the lifespan. In a 12-month period at any given time, uh, the 12-month the prevalence is estimated to be a bit over 1%. This is similar to the US where the lifetime prevalence is estimated to be about 6%, a little bit lower. 12 month prevalence has been estimated to vary uh, from one and a half to around 3%, so a bit higher. But in general, again, cannabis use disorder seems to affect a relatively small minority of individuals who use cannabis. To put this in context, these are two, uh, two findings that I think are particularly informative. The first is looking at the proportion of individuals who use a substance who then uh, who uh, who concurrently have uh, dependence on that substance. So these are data from the very large NISARC epidemiological study in the U.S. And what we find is that when looking among active cannabis users, in this case, uh, approximately eight percent met criteria for dependence. This was conducted during DSM when DSM four was the uh, there's a logical framework, hence the dependence title. Um, so a bit less than one in 10 of active cannabis users met criteria for cannabis uh, use disorder. This was around the same number as alcohol, a little bit higher, um, considerably smaller than stimulants or uh, opioids, even smaller still than tobacco for whom uh, about uh, half actually met uh, the criteria for dependence among people who were active smokers. The other way to look at this uh, again, using the very large NISARC data set is 
looking at uh, whether or not people will develop the, a substance use over their lifetime um, based on ever use. So again, this is not focusing on people who've never used cannabis or other substances, but among people who reported lifetime use of cannabis in the epidemiological interview, about 9% met criteria for CUD at some point, and this was considerably lower than alcohol, cocaine, and again, tobacco was actually the, the number one with about two thirds reporting meeting lifetime criteria for tobacco use disorder among ever smokers. So on balance, relatively low abuse liability compared to other psychoactive drugs. What about treatments? Well, the reality is there are no uh, pharmacological treatments that have currently been approved at this point. There's a lot of interest in different compounds. There's some very promising uh, preclinical work that recently came out of Meg Haney's lab at uh, Columbia. But at this point, there are no Health Canada approved medications for treating cannabis use disorder. In terms of psychological in interventions, there are really three that have been shown to be effective across a number of different studies. Motivational enhancement therapy uses structured motivational interviewing to really uh, try to help a person marshal their own resources to change their behavior. Cognitive behavioral therapy focuses on skills training and functional analysis to help a person change the determinants that lead to cannabis use. And contingency management uses direct financial incentives to try to motivate the individual to reduce their cannabis use in the short run and is typically provided along with other active treatments rather than as a standalone treatment. So there are effective treatments, although at this point, no medications have been approved. Okay, what about cannabis and cognition? So just to back up for a second, why would we be so interested in cannabis and cognition? And again, I'm gonna go back to the endocannabinoid system where we see very high density of CB1 receptors in critical areas of the brain. You've seen this slide a couple of times, but what I wanna emphasize is given how critical the endocannabinoid system is in cognition, of course, we would want to understand uh, how cannabis relates to it. In addition, um, cannabis use disorder only occurs in a relatively small minority of individuals, whereas adverse consequences on cognition would really be relative relevant to all cannabis users, including individuals who are using cannabis for medical purposes. As I said, it's particularly pertinent to, to that subgroup in part because they are more likely to use daily or at heavier levels um, by virtue of managing chronic health conditions. And at this point, the other reason we're particularly interested in it is because there, there have been a lot of inconsistencies. And part of that has to do with uh, the challenges in doing neuropsychological testing. But uh, as you'll see, we've been able to make some progress and, and get some traction on that front. So to start with some background, there, there's a really nice review on cannabis and cognition that was conducted by a, an Australian group uh, in 2016, in which they combed through the large and fairly woolly literature um, to identify 105 studies that directly spoke to this issue. And what they found is a, uh, a, a quite heterogeneous literature, but with some uh, clear evidence of consistent findings and some areas that clearly need elucidation. And I'm gonna walk through this table piece by piece. The, the areas of greatest consistency in terms of acute effects were evidence of acute effects of cannabis on verbal learning and memory, attention, psychomotor function, and inhibition. So really a combination of higher order executive function type uh, cognitive faculties, but also uh, faculties that really are at the intersection of cognition and motor execution in the form of psychomotor function and inhibition. When it comes to chronic use, there's clear evidence that ongoing chronic use is also associated with decrements in verbal learning and memory, attention, attentional bias, and to a lesser extent, psychomotor function. The more plus signs here, I should say, uh, the stronger the, the evidence. And then things got really equivocal when we looked at to what extent do these uh, cognitive decrements persist if a person stops using. And, here you can see that there are a combination of mostly plus and minuses <clears throat> uh, or minuses where it appears to suggest that largely a lot of the, the effects do dissipate with the passage of time along with abstinence. 
The other consideration was that there were a number of other parameters that had been uh, that were significant moderators or other um, influencing variables in this literature. A common one was age of onset, how early a person started using cannabis, um, but others included the frequency or sex even as a uh, moderating variable. So as a result, the conclusion from Broyd et al. was really that there are some consistent effects. What's really unclear is whether or not they are longstanding if a person stops using cannabis and the role of uh, cannabis uh, of these other parameters in terms of the level of severity of these effects. So again, to reiterate, inconsistent empirical findings. Another concern was that uh, there, it, there may very well be publication bias in the form of small study bias. Neuropsychological testing is quite lengthy and demanding and does not lend itself to large sample size studies. As a result, a small study that has meaningful findings may be more likely to be published than one that does not, that's underpowered. Another issue it may be around measurement error because a lot of different instruments were being used and it may be that there's differential sensitivity by instruments. And then the other consideration was uh, that there may be a number of confounding variables because along with small study bias, in small studies, there's insufficient statistical power to include uh, the entirety of potential confounders that one would attempt to adjust for. The other consideration here is just what people think about uh, cannabis. And just to give you a sense for um, the, the, the sense for the general public in terms of cannabis effects, um, this is, these are data from a, uh, a local cohort that you'll hear lots about over the course of this conference. But what we find is that in terms of the uh, overall public sense of the, the negative consequences, Things like balance, concentration, attention, decision-making, coordination, memory, and reaction time, these are all the areas that people in general tend to think are the areas of uh, adverse consequences. So it makes them a very good, a very obvious target for understanding these effects, because of course they may be influenced by expectancies, but we have to assume that people are reporting these negative consequences in part based on uh, actual pharmacological effects. These actually are uh, the differences when you segregate the data by cannabis users versus non-cannabis users. In general, the cannabis, uh, the non-cannabis users tend to see these as being more negative, but in both cases, what we see is that uh, there's a, a global perspective that cannabis is uh, generally negative in terms of a variety of different forms of cognition. So let me tell you about some of the findings we found at the DeGroote Center. These are data that we originally started analyzing as part of a, a, an initiative uh, led by the center in terms of cannabis and cognition. We started with data from the Human Connectome Project, uh, which is a, a really impressive open science uh, brain imaging study. It also includes a comprehensive neuropsychological battery and has more than uh, 1,200 participants. After quality control, we wound up with a bit over 1,100 participants, and this really gave us high statistical power. It allowed us to adjust for all the necessary confounders. And within the HCP project, there were a variety of different cannabis indicators, whether or not a person had cannabis use disorder, their age of first use, their frequency of use, and whether or not they had uh, urine uh, drug screen findings of uh, uh, positive that were positive for THC. So here you can see the neuropsychological battery and what it was measuring. And what we found overall was that um, if we looked at different effects, these are the uh, p-values and changes in R squared with different cannabis indicators. We actually found that there were only three significant associations. And specifically, we found that having cannabis use disorder was associated with a decrement in overall fluid intelligence of a relatively small effect size. And then uh, being positive for THC in a person's urine was also significantly associated with nonverbal episodic memory and processing speed. Again, that psychomotor speed uh, domain that I mentioned before. So recent use of cannabis or heavy use that reflected was reflected in a person's uh, urine was also associated with relatively small effect size differences. 
In the same human connectome project study, what we found was that uh, when we looked at uh, working memory as measured by the NBAC or a, a neuropsychological test that measures how good you are remembering a, uh, a, a, a in this case, a, an image that was several images ago using your working memory, we found that there were meaningful differences. And to start, we characterized where in the brain was uh, the visual end back being subserved in the human connectome project. And what we found was uh, very consistent with other studies looking at working memory, um, central medial uh, frontal gyrus, uh, decreases in activity in ventromedial prefrontal cortex reflecting suppression of the default mode network, uh, also uh, implication of the, the insular reflecting the salience. Um, and then when we looked at the differences based on cannabis use uh, indicators, what we found was that uh, only one of them was significantly associated with brain activity during the NBAC. And that was whether or not an individual was positive for THC in their urine. And what we found was that there were there was significantly worse performance, that is people uh, were less able to remember recent information. And that was uh, associated with decreased activity in the uh, central uh, medial frontal gyrus and increased activity in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Remember that area I showed you in the previous slide that reflected suppression of the default mode network. And then when we modeled this simultaneously, we found that this THC positive status in relation to poor working memory accuracy was significantly mediated by the greater activity in uh, the uh, ventromedial PFC and the reduced uh, activity in the uh, uh, central medial frontal gyrus. And I actually said that backwards. This is uh, reduced activity in the medial frontal gyrus. This is uh, greater activity in uh, the ventromedial PFC. But fundamentally, what we found was that there was a, uh, an increase in activity in task negative regions and a decrease in activity in task positive regions that were responsible for the uh, poorer performance in working memory accuracy. These findings are uh, really consistent with an abstinence effect, that if you stop using cannabis and the THC is no longer detectable in urine, then many of the cognitive consequences will no longer be present. And I want to uh, highlight what I consider kind of a classic in this area that shows similar uh, abstinence effects. Um, what you can see is that uh, if you look at active uh, cannabis users versus control individuals using neuropsychological testing, there are significant differences uh, at the beginning of a protocol. Um, although former cannabis users do not look different on any of the indicators. So if you've stopped using cannabis, uh, your neuropsychological profile looks the same. For the active cannabis users, in this protocol where they use biochemically verified abstinence over a 28 day period, over time, this, these effects all dissipate so that by day 28, uh, long-term retrieval, long-term storage and total recall all show no significant differences relative to controls. The same is true for uh, other domains of cognitive functioning that again, uh, former cannabis users do not look different from control individuals who had never used cannabis and uh, active cannabis users in both cases after 28 days no longer show significant differences in terms of cognition. So it appears that there are differences, but they are very much driven by recent use rather than uh, uh, persistent use or, or uh, longstanding changes that don't resolve in time. Also consistent with this is a finding from a recent meta-analysis looking at changes in uh, neuropsychological functioning in young people. And this is a, a meta-analysis that segregated studies according to how much abstinence was uh, used before testing for neuropsychological differences uh, in uh, adolescents using cannabis versus controls. And what it found was that if there was no abstinence period or less than three days abstinence, there was a meaningful uh, and significant decrement in cognitive performance. About 
a third of a standard deviation, a Cohen's D of uh, negative 0 0.3. Once you started looking at studies that had longer washout periods or longer abstinence periods, this effect was no longer significant and is clearly much closer to zero, less than uh, 0 0.1. So again, what we see is that uh, although there seems to be evidence of uh, association with cognitive decrements, the, uh, the, the size of these effects gets smaller and smaller or non-significant as abstinence grows longer. We've seen this in other studies in uh, my laboratory. So this is a group of community adults uh, reporting uh, various levels of cannabis use. In this case, we saw that in most cases, um, there was no significant difference in cognitive performance. There were only significant differences in terms of uh, impulsivity as measured by delayed discounting uh, and also self-reported ADHD symptoms. Um, this was particularly interesting because it was not related to age or first use and exclusively related to the severity of uh, cannabis use involvement. So starting earlier really did not make any difference. It was, it, it was not uh, associated independently and was not a moderating factor of level of overall cannabis severity. We've done this uh, also in two samples of emerging adults. Uh, again, using extensive batteries of neuropsychological testing, we found only a minority of domains show significant differences. Again, the, the most consistent one is uh, impulsivity as measured by delayed discounting and self-reported ADHD symptoms. Again, this is only associated with cannabis use severity, not age of first use. And these were findings from a, a cohort of um, uh, young people recruited from the Hamilton area, but we found very similar findings in uh, a sample uh, recruited in the U.S., uh, with one difference that in the U.S. sample, we found that there was a significant decrement in working memory also uh, in these individuals, but otherwise uh, the effects were all associated with either impulsivity or self-reported ADHD symptoms uh, consistently associated with cannabis use severity, not age of uh, first use. And then the last point I'll make in these two studies, this is the Canadian young adult cohort. This is the American uh, young adult cohort. When we divided people up based on how frequently they used cannabis, the, uh, the differences were really driven by uh, the daily or multiple times daily cannabis users. So when it came to ADHD symptoms in particular, uh, we saw significantly greater uh, levels based on uh, in the, the, the daily users compared to the uh, none or no recent cannabis use. So there really does seem to be a, a fairly clear dose response relationship, heavy use, frequent use, and obviously not uh, having a period of abstinence are all associated with much more uh, obvious uh, decrements in cognitive performance. When it comes to ADHD, this has been one of our uh, most uh, robust findings. And so what's not clear is, is the cannabis use leading to cognitive symptoms that give people a sense of experiencing attentional deficits? Is it the case that people are uh, who have ADHD are more likely to seek out cannabis? Um, since ADHD is a, a diagnosis that has to be given based on childhood, childhood behavior that predates cannabis, that's not very clear from these observational data. And then, of course, there may also be a third variable in which there are other factors that are leading both to higher endorsement of ADHD symptoms and also uh, higher uh, involvement with cannabis and uh, higher severity of cannabis. So this is one of the, the areas we're really hoping to, to get traction and move uh, forward with uh, in the coming years. What about the functional trickle-down effects of these cognitive impacts? So uh, as I uh, showed before, one of the more uh, robust and consistent effects is effects on psychomotor function and inhibitory control, especially uh, in terms of acute cannabis use. And where this becomes really important is not just in terms of general functioning, but in terms of uh, functioning when operating a motor vehicle or in other safety sensitive settings. So in, in this uh, regard, 
What we know from a very large literature is that there does seem to be consistent evidence of, uh, ne of uh, increased risk of car crash. Um, these are uh, findings from a synthesis of meta-analyses. Um, and what I'm gonna draw your attention to are the confidence intervals across these uh, several different meta-analyses. In some cases, uh, comprising more than 200,000 participants, uh, in each case, and where you have non-overlapping confidence intervals, uh, you will essentially be looking at the significant findings across studies. And here uh, is the determination of the uh, quality of the literature with a plus sign indicating acceptable quality and two plus signs indicating high quality. So what you can see is from a 10,000 foot perspective in a literature that is relatively high quality, in most cases, there is significant evidence that cannabis involvement is associated with an adverse outcome when it comes to uh, uh, automobile outcomes. That's not the case in all of them. And the effect sizes on the whole tend to be relatively small, but at the aggregate level, there is very robust evidence that cannabis involvement and Indeed, the associated uh, cognitive impairment is associated with uh, car crash risk, uh, although with some ambiguity. From this review, their conclusions were essentially that these are uh, robust, statistically significant relationships. They tend to be of relatively small magnitude effect size, often smaller than the effect sizes associated with uh, car crashes from alcohol, but they are non nonetheless present. There's a lot of heterogeneity by the type of study, by the severity of crash, and by the method of measurement. Um, there, as a result, it's hard to make clear uh, inferences about what the uh, exact effect sizes are depending on the, the subtype. And unfortunately, there's a lot more ambiguity still when it comes to exactly what the most risky levels of THC are uh, when it comes to car crash risk. And where they land in this synthesis of syntheses is that there's no scientifically supported clear cutoff concentration that can be derived, but nonetheless, one of the most uh, robust downstream consequences of cognitive effects of cannabis does appear to be its association with greater risk of uh, car crashes. What about other mental health conditions? Well. Uh, outside of cannabis use disorder, uh, cannabis is associated with virtually all other psychiatric conditions. And so just to sort of uh, highlight this, where we start with the, the highest associations, these are data from the uh, NISARC Epidemiological Survey. If you look at other substance use disorders, cannabis use disorder uh, is associated with a several fold increase in likelihood for uh, alcohol use disorder and tobacco use disorder. These are data from the original NISARC study that had a bit over 43,000 participants. These are from NISARC 3 that had uh, around 35,000 participants. Uh, and what you can see is there are very large magnitude associations with other substance use disorders. If we move to affective disorders, the effect sizes get smaller, but are still statistically significant and by no means non-trivial. The same is true for uh, anxiety disorders, ranging from panic disorder to specific phobia, generalized anxiety disorder, and PTSD. In each case, we see robust uh, odds ratios suggesting greater probability of these conditions with cannabis use disorder. And then finally, when it comes to personality disorder, the largest effects seem to be uh, with uh, antisocial personality disorder and borderline personality disorder, although interestingly also with uh, dependent personality disorder. So fundamentally, cannabis is associated and tends to be a, a fellow traveler with most other psychiatric conditions. When it comes to longitudinal findings, um, because all the preceding findings were uh, cross-sectional, what we find is that there is a longitudinal association uh, and it is not a, a matter of uh, both simply coexisting. So in, in a meta-analysis of longitudinal studies on anxiety disorder, there's evidence that it is significantly associated with uh, the odds of developing any anxiety condition. Uh, there are parallel findings for cannabis and self-injurious behavior. The cross-sectional odds ratio is 
uh, 1.57, um, which is certainly non-trivial. But what's really interesting is that from longitudinal studies, it seems to be actually considerably larger in terms of cannabis use being uh, a robust predictor of uh, either non-suicidal self-injury or uh, suicidal behavior. In, in many of the cases, uh, the studies are observational. So, uh, and even in longitudinal studies, these are observational designs. You can't assign someone to, to these outcomes. So we can't be certain of causality, but we've moved a long way away from not being able to uh, uh, separate out the, or tell which came first, the chicken or the egg. What we see is that cannabis does longitudinally forecast anxiety and self-injurious behavior. The same is very much the case for psychosis. Uh, there is a robust association with the likelihood of developing psychosis. There's a relative risk ratio of uh, about 1.7. And uh, large scale uh, population studies now are estimating that the proportion of uh, psychoses observed in European countries is non-trivial. So for example, one study of five European countries uh, estimated that the proportionate attributable fraction was 12%. Uh, in a more recent study in Denmark, uh, a, a study of more than 6 million uh, Danish adults, the proportionate attributable risk fraction was about 20%. So about one in five episodes of psychosis was believed to be uh, attributable to uh, cannabis. What was notable about that study also is that uh, here we saw a substantially higher risk of males developing psychosis uh, with an adjusted uh, risk ratio of nearly four compared to females with an adjusted risk ratio of approaching two. So um, whether this is related to simply males using more frequently or more cannabis uh, is not clear, um, but nonetheless, it appears to be a, a sizable contributor to psychosis at the population level. And that's especially the case for young adult males. One critical nuance here is that there's a fairly clear dose dependent relationship with THC potency. The higher the potency, the higher the probability of uh, psychosis risk. And so when this is then uh, dismount dismantled into different levels of frequency, what you can see is that the relative risk gets progressively smaller with infrequent use and progressively larger with uh, increased, uh, increasingly frequent use. So the relative risk ratio for daily use is about 1.76, whereas for annual or monthly use, there are non-significant risk ratios that are around 1, 1 1.1. So a very robust relationship, but one that is highly dose dependent. What about cannabis and lung health? Well, the, the reality is that we know most people continue to consume cannabis via uh, inhaled dried flower smoke. And the other reality is that inhaling any smoke harms the lung. Combusted plant matter or combusted material in the form of uh, fire from a house fire or a bonfire of any kind uh, harms the lung. And in turn, we shouldn't be surprised to know that uh, cannabis smoke also harms the lung. This takes the form in a number of different ways. Uh, the, the most robust evidence suggests that cannabis use, specifically inhaled uh, cannabis smoke, is associated with chronic bronchitis and cough. Um, it's also been found to lead to deficits in alveolar macrophages. Um, and uh, as a result, decreased cytokines and antimicrobial activity in the lung, further potentially increasing risk. This may not be a big deal in uh, generally healthy adults or young adults, but this can be very problematical in individuals who have uh, uh, immune compromise. And uh, what we know is there have been case reports of individuals becoming severely ill or even dying as a result of lung complications from uh, cannabis or mold in illegal contraband cannabis in immune compromised individuals. What we don't know is really whether cannabis use is associated with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It does not appear to be associated with lung cancer at this point. And we also don't know a great deal about uh, the extent to which vaping cannabis or inhaling vapor rather than combusted smoke 
is associated with uh, demonstrable differences in uh, lung function or, or health. Although uh, we do have a study that's underway at the uh, MGD CMCR taking on that question. So those are really high priorities for the future. Last area of uh, concern is uh, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, which until relatively recently, really uh, about a decade ago, was considered a, an incredibly rare condition that was only um, described in case reports, um, but has become much more common and, uh, and, and is, is something of a medical mystery still. So what can, uh, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome comprises is a syndrome of symptoms including loss of appetite, acute pain uh, in the, the stomach and abdomen, uh, intense nausea and repeated vomiting. Um, and these symptoms are only relieved by the individual taking very hot baths or hot showers. So it's very unclear why this would provide relief, but this uh, syndrome of GI symptoms uh, is, is uh, very uncomfortable, uh, often precipitates a person coming to the emergency department and is only managed with uh, hot baths or showers. It's, uh, it's considered to be rare in the general population, but at least by anecdotal report uh, from colleagues who work in the emergency departments here in Hamilton, it is increasingly common. In daily users, the rates of cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome have been estimated to be as high as one in three, um, but are probably more likely uh, one in 10 or one in 15. In any case, uh, it does appear to be much more common, perhaps because of the uh, increasingly high levels of THC in contemporary products. And what's really problematical is that there are very few good treatments for this uh, condition. At this point, all of the traditional anti-emetic uh, treatments have been shown to not be effective in controlling uh, the vomiting or the nausea. Uh, the most common strategies that are being employed now are uh, atypical antipsychotics, uh, specifically haloperidol or droperidol, uh, which in some open label studies have resulted in positive uh, responses. And then a topical capsaicin uh, um, administered to the belly is also uh, increasingly used, although with, with mixed evidence in uh, admittedly an extremely small literature. Fundamentally, the only thing that has been shown to really lead to long-term remission of cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome is terminating cannabis use. And that as a result, of course, can lead to withdrawal and discomfort and may take some time to uh, alleviate the CHS, but uh, in terms of uh, active uh, interventions, none of the, the current standards of care have been shown to be uh, particularly uh, helpful. All right, so just to wrap up, we're approaching the end of the hour. Um, we started with a, a laundry list of possible risks and harms, and fundamentally, um, there is evidence that provides uh, uh, there is robust evidence in each of these cases that uh, cannabis use for disorder, for example, is real. Cannabis effects on cognition are real. Cannabis is associated with traffic accidents. Cannabis is associated with the presence of and exacerbation of other mental health conditions. Cannabis poses risks for lung health. And cannabis is implicated necessarily in cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. So in each case, it's not a matter of potential risks and harms. These are actual risks and harms. In terms of contextualizing them, it is complicated to the extent that most individuals who use cannabis will not experience cannabis use disorder or cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, and indeed may not experience significant cognitive effects outside of uh, the acute administration. In addition, the cognitive effects do appear to be largely reversible. Um, we have, at least in my studies, we found no evidence that age of first use leads to permanent changes in cognition. Um, and although there is evidence that if you start early and never stop, there are longstanding cognitive consequences, um, most of the evidence suggests that if people do stop using, most of the cognitive consequences will uh, 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 return to normal. 
The other reality is that uh, across these risks and harms, the, the level of risk really scales to the level of use. It, it, it's increasingly clear that it's frequent use, heavy use, especially uh, heavy use of high THC products that are uh, the, the behavioral patterns that are most associated with experiencing these risks. So in terms of thinking uh, globally about the overall risk profile of cannabis, I, I think that uh, these data can be helpful. Uh, these are uh, uh, data from a study looking at uh, drug expert attributions about risks and harms across a wide array of different drugs, and then judging the harm to the users and the harm to others, and coming up with an overall harm score. And as a result, coming up with an overall kind of risk uh, attribution. And uh, where people landed for cannabis is probably about where I land for cannabis. It was uh, scored right in the middle of the pack. There is definitely evidence of harm to self. There is evidence of harm to others. Alcohol is actually the psychoactive drug identified to be associated with the greatest total harms. And so in terms of thinking about overall risks and harms, there's no question that cannabis is not benign. Uh, there's no question that cannabis does have risks and harms, but on balance, uh, the, the level of liability is probably less than a variety of other substances, including other legally available substances like alcohol and tobacco, and certainly other uh, illegal substances like opioids or uh, illegal stimulants. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you all for your time. I'm happy to answer some more questions. Thank you very much for the talk. A couple of questions. Again, if you're just joining us, please put any questions you have in the Q&A box. From Marilyn White Campbell, wondering if hyperemesis syndrome is riskier in older adults. Also wondering about the use of ginger for hyperemesis syndrome. So I have, I have two fairly unsatisfactory answers. Uh, the, the first is that I'm not aware of higher rates in older adults. Um, this is anecdotal evidence, but from the emergency department physicians I've talked to, it tends to occur in young people who are very heavy uh, users and consume high THC products. What we do see is that um, in seniors, often many of the products that are used tend to be lower THC, which is for the good, it tends to be higher CBD products, often for uh, chronic pain. Um, so I, I would be a little surprised, but I'm not aware of any data that speaks to um, higher risk in older adults. Now, the, the use of ginger, I, I actually haven't heard of any applications, but I think it's an interesting hypothesis. And Marilyn follows up, if an older adult is continuously vomiting, it can lead to acute confusion. That's absolutely right. Uh, from Ryan McNeil, just to clarify, did your findings show that the DMN is suppressed in cannabis users even after the psychoactive effects cease? So um, those findings showed that uh, th that is correct, fundamentally. The, 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 the findings were among individuals who were not intoxicated and had no psychoactive effects and, and reported no drug use in the, the previous 24 hours that still had uh, were THC positive in their urine. And they showed uh, uh, essentially inefficient DMN suppression during the working memory task. I should clarify, it's not like global DMN suppression, although that's a very interesting question. I don't know if anyone's shown that, but we found that basically there was a uh, inefficiency of uh, suppressing the default mode network and engaging the task positive working memory network uh, even uh, in, in a, a non-impaired, uh, non-intoxicated group. From Robert Gabris, uh, how common are these outcomes and cannabis use disorder in particular among people who use cannabis for medical purposes? 
That's a great question, Rob. And that's a, a really significant issue because there's a lot of concern about uh, a iatrogenic cannabis use disorder or the, the development of cannabis use disorder uh, by way of a healthcare professional initially authorizing or prescribing. That would be similar to the way uh, a, a group of individuals or a subgroup of individuals became addicted to opioids. Um, we don't no, definitively. Jason's meta-analysis, uh, I should say meta-analyses, have um, identified small proportions on the whole. Uh, in my own data, uh, in recent, uh, albeit unpublished findings, we found that among individuals who reported using cannabis for medical purposes, but only for medical purposes, none met criteria for cannabis use disorder. But among individuals who reported using for both medical and recreational purposes, about one in five met criteria. And we also recently found that among individuals in substance use disorder treatment, about one in three individuals who reported using cannabis for medical purposes met criteria for cannabis use disorder. So the numbers are still a little um, all over the place because there are not all that many studies that have systematically investigated this question. There is one that's actually uh, actively underway locally here. But I think that um, that's one of those really thorny questions that we need to get to the bottom of, because certainly um, we want to minimize uh, the development of cannabis use disorder uh, as a result of trying cannabis for medical purposes. We'll take a couple more questions uh, from Raymond Yang. Regarding the effects of cannabis on ADHD, are the effects more related to THC or CBD? Also a good question. I, the, the studies that I presented there did not distinguish between, only asked people about frequency and severity of use without getting into the exact products that they were using. So I would assume that because these were high risk young adults, they were mostly consuming uh, moderate to higher uh, THC level products. I would also be very surprised if CBD led to uh, significant cognitive consequences. There, there are people like to say that CBD has uh, no psychoactive effects, although it does have direct effects uh, in terms of nausea and, and GI distress. So people can detect taking CBD, but I would be very surprised if it had cognitive effects. So to me, the association with, with ADHD, it would I would expect to be largely driven by THC. Question from Peter, regarding cannabis use disorder and its criteria, are you aware of any common clustering of symptoms as opposed to random distribution? If so, are there differences in clinical treatment success slash outcomes? It's a great question. Um, in, in general, for cannabis use disorder as well as for other substance use disorders, what we tend to see is that they're unidimensional and um, do not really break into different subsets, although one could do uh, an analysis like that. Uh, on the whole, uh, the, the cannabis use disorder syndrome tends to be a, a dimensional syndrome. I'm not aware of any specific cluster of symptoms that's associated with uh, more negative outcomes. From D. Bruce, you mentioned that the risks scale level of use, frequency, amount, high THC products. Can you elaborate what is considered high THC and frequent use? Yeah. So I don't think that we have a, a perfect operational definition of frequent use yet, but what I've seen in my studies is that there seems to be a gradient of risk such that people who report using cannabis monthly or weekly look very different from people who report using cannabis daily or multiple times daily. And this may not be a perfectly precise answer, but I would I would define daily or approximately daily use as frequent use. In terms of uh, what high THC means, if you go back to, uh, well, certainly the, the 1970s, 1980s, but definitely the 90s, the level of THC in dried flour would have ranged from three to about seven. Now uh, it's typical for dried flour to be between 10 and 15% THC and sometimes in excess of 20%. I would consider 10 to 20 moderate to high and greater than uh, 20 high THC. Um, the, the last consideration is uh, 
in, if you're looking at non-inhaled products, a useful heuristic is that the National Institute on Drug Abuse in the US now uses five milligrams as a, a standard dose of cannabis. And that's intended for research purposes, but it has relevance for general consumption because I think that if you're if you think of it as being a, a meaningful dose, then a, for example, 25 milligram gummy is like five doses. Um, and that's that's that would be a, a fairly sizable uh amount of, of THC for a person to consume, especially someone who doesn't consume um uh commonly. Uh 